All right, so we jump right to an application. So we have a heat exchanger. It has some hot gas at 200 degrees F, that's inlet temperature, and at two pounds mass per second. And, it's full, and this section of the compact heat exchanger goes over a wavy fin, plate fin surface defined with the number 17.8-3 ACE-W. And the fins are made of aluminum as well as the plate made of aluminum that separates the boundary between the other set of fins. In the other direction, we have cool air. So hot gas and cool air, both of them are modeled as air. Uh, 50 degrees F coming in, two pounds per second. It's a plain plate fin surface 9.03, which is defined, and aluminum. So uh, the dimensions are given, so L1 is this dimension right here. And if this is um, surface one, the cold fluid is flowing through the section one or side one of this compact heat exchanger, and the, the flow path length is L1, 4.5 feet, or 4.6 feet. Okay, the hot gases flow through side two, through the section surface two, flowing that way, and the direction of flow is one foot. All right, and then you have to make it sufficiently large so the third dimension is 1.3 foot, giving us what we've analyzed before as n combination of those plates. So there'd be uh, 12 passages for through surface one, and then 12 passages through surface two. So 12 of those sections make up the whole heat exchanger. All right. This uh, problem is worked out in the chapter like three, but what do we do now? Once you are able to finally analyze it, and you have great confidence that you've analyzed it, you have a lot of these input variables that have mean values to it, but then you go back and you interrogate to say, is there any uncertainty in any of these inputs? Well, it's not hard to dream up some uncertainty. So this is uh, straight out of the textbook table six five. So we're going to complete an uncertainty analysis for that heat exchanger problem. So here is side one. So that's a plain fin uh, number 903. We can go back and take a look. What was flowing through the 903 plain fin side? It was cool air coming in at 50 degrees F. So here is the first. It's mass flow rate one. It's a uh, kilograms per second. Uh, all semester we've been working in pounds per second or pounds per hour. So I didn't reproduce this in the SI units. I reproduced it in equivalent foot pound second units. Okay. So the nominal value is two, I mean, sorry, 0 0.9 kilograms per second with a 5% uncertainty. So this is now the additional information, the uncertainty about each of those values. Well, let's take a look at the second input value. The mean density, nominal value 1.13, blah, 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 too many digits, with plus or minus 5% uncertainty. So that's the uncertainty. So um, if you really want to make sure and understand that, what you say is, is you have a range for the mass flow rate kind of from a low to a high. For the low, take 0.9. Multiply it by 0.05, take that and subtract it off of 0.9, or basically it's 0.95 times 0.9. So 0.95 times 0.9, or 1.05 times 0.9. That would be high low. We talked last time, this is 95% capturing the data, 1 and 20 is in the tails. 19 and 20 is, is uh, in that range. Similarly for this mean density. What is this? The inlet density. What is this? The exit density. What is this? The mean viscosity. So this mean viscosity, your fluid properties all have some uncertainty. 
So it looks like uh, 5%, 3%, 10%, 5%. These are picked uh, by the analyst uh, using a lot of judgment, and sometimes uh, there's a reason for it. Like the instrumentation shows a variation or the you know, uncertainty in that property just from not knowing precisely the perfect uh, composition of the fluid, fluid variability. All right. Prandtl number, here, what do they do on this one? They don't give us a percent or fractional uncertainty, they give us a value of that uncertainty. So you can compute that equivalent percent just like we can compute the equivalent uncertainty absolute. All right. Specific heat, what is this? The parting plate spacing, M, that's given with a low uncertainty, 3%. Surface area density, meters squared per meter cubed, given with a 5% uncertainty. The hydraulic diameter, you can see there, okay, for the hydraulic diameter and for that exit density, there's a higher uncertainty for each of those parameters. Well, just for the first side, there's 23. <coughs> then there's a bunch for the second side. I don't think I copied the whole table. I truncated it. And it goes down to 50 inputs. So this is more like what you might be accustomed to in practice. Just instead of two or three inputs on the exam, uh, and you have the uncertainty you propagated through. I got 50 inputs. All right, and they have all uncertainties. Um, near the end of the list, we have some inlet loss coefficients and exit loss coefficients. Those are associated with the pressure drops across that heat exchanger, kind of getting it in and getting it out. Uh, they even have coal burn and friction factor. There's uncertainty in the correlation. So how do they handle that? Well, one way that they do is, is they'll have a plot of the, uh, the Colburn J factor as a function of Reynolds number. Maybe it does something like that. Here's the Reynolds number going this way. And you get a bunch of data points. And then you can put it in and you can linear interpolate such that when I get a Reynolds number, I come in here and I get one and only one J which is the Colburn heat transfer factor, J factor, right? Well, that comes from some linear interpolation or some model, but then they just multiply around 25%. And so here's 25%, here's 25%. Uh, how could you handle that in the code? I can show you how I handled it in Excel. But um, there you go. Um, okay, let's press forward. I think you get the gist, right? Now, there's a lot of outputs of interest in this heat exchanger. So these are the responses. These are the outputs. What would be a typical output? Well, how much heat is transferred inside that heat exchanger, given the dimensions, the mass flow rates, et cetera? And uh, straight from the textbook, they're saying 51,000 watts is the nominal output value for Q, the rate of heat transfer. And then the hard part is, is not only getting the mean, so you got Q is equal to the mean, but you have some uncertainty in the Q. And so it's plus or minus 4,000 watts. Let me ask you this, if you have a calculator, express that is this a 4,000, is that a fractional or an absolute uncertainty? Absolute. Can you express it as a fractional? About 7.8%. Thumbs up if you agree. Good. Anybody else? Good. Huh? You got it? All right. So I like to put them in percentages. I think it's easier for me to compare. Uh, so we have that. What is delta P1? It's in Pascal. So what do you think that is? On side one, that's the overall pressure drop through the system. 
it's due to squeezing it in and the, the major loss through, through the run due to the, the friction factor inside that heat exchanger and then the loss both on the entrance and exit. All right. There could be some acceleration. It's all taken into account in that um, analysis for that pressure drop. What is uh, this next one? Well, it's in temperature, isn't it? So what is that, that third? What is it? The temperature, side one, exit. And they give it to you in Kelvin. They give it to you in Kelvin. Um, delta P2, so delta P2 is pressure drop on the other side and then the temperature exit of side two in Kelvin. All right, so those, you can have multiple outputs of interest. Well, then they show you here for the heat exchanger rating Q, so all of this is for Q. What they did was they tried to say which parameter drives the response of interest, Q. So, um, the most important side is this relative contribution, so the empty boxes, instead of the normalized sensitivity coefficient. You can look that up. We could have talked about it, but we skipped that part. What you're really interested in is the relative contribution to the uncertainty in Q, which of those input parameters drive it. So you take a look. You got this one, this one, and this one all around 20%, isn't it? Three of them around 20%. They sum up to 60%. 60% of the uncertainty is driven by three inputs. So let's take a look down here. What is this input? Temperature. What is that one? T1 in. T1 for that side in. What is this one? Temperature 2 in, temperature for the side 2 in, and this one, what is that? It's a J, or lowercase j often, J Colburn heat transfer factor for side 1, for side 1. Okay, well, uh, I see that the, the T1N and the T2N are important. That kind of makes sense to me. The Colburn heat transfer factor for side one. What's the question you might have right away? Where is the Colburn heat transfer factor for side two? How important is it? And there it is right there. It's not as important, is it? So this accounts for the nominal value of each of those inputs plus their uncertainty. That gives you the relative contribution to the uncertainty in the response Q. Basically, I would call this the importance. Importance. Importance is the product of the sensitivity and the uncertainty. You can't have something that's important in driving the response if the response isn't sensitive to that input. But even if it's sensitive to that input, you also need some uncertainty in that input. And when you have both sensi model is sensitive to it and you have some uncertainty in it, then it can be a very important driver in the uncertainty in the response. So this really is importance, although very few people would call it importance. They would call it some relative contribution of what? By percentage of what? Well, do you think these all sum up to 100%? Yeah, they do. They sum up to 100%. And so it's normalized contribution it to be a normalized importance. Let's take a look at what else is on this list. What would be kind of uh, this one right here and here? What are those two? C sub P, that's the property, specific heat of the gas coming in. 
And the M means uh, C, sub, C sub P, <coughs> that's specific heat for the side one, and it's the mean value because that's the mean value that you use throughout the heat exchanger. All right. What about this one? The mass flow rate of the fluid inside one. You say, well, where is the mass flow rate in the fluid inside two? Well, yeah, it's it's as it's important as well, but it's maybe not as strongly important as the side one. Same with the specific heat. So if I did the uh, the two inlet temperatures, if I did the cold burn heat transfer factor on the side one, ignored side two, and then I did these other four, I pretty well would cover all of it. There's one other that maybe is showing up. It's down in the 4% range. What is this one right here? Hydraulic diameter. Hydraulic diameter for side one. Okay. That's how you would read this. I, I would ignore this side right here. I would just emphasize the, the importance or relative contribution as a fraction or percentage. Um, what did I do? Well, I'm going to uh, second jump to the Excel code, but before I jump to the Excel code, this is what I did. I, I, I followed the textbook and tried to put the, the, the parameters in the same order, all right? But some of them I knew were just not going to be in there, and so why do the expense of coding it up? I hadn't coded it up before for some temperature correction property factors, so I left that out. So I didn't get to quite 50, but I coded them up. So, so I go through 21 associated with side 1, and here they all are, m dot. Now we don't have the kilograms per second, we have pounds per second, and that's pretty close. It's like 1.98 instead of 2 if you convert what they had for kilograms per second over. So it's 2, kilogram, two pounds per second with the same relative uncertainty, 5%, 5%, 3%, 10%. I tried to stay with those. So we just, a lot of these are just directly transferred here. Prandtl number is dimensionless, so boom. And uh, it's around 5%. Specific heat, 0.24, 5%. A lot of these parameters. B is a spacing of the, um, the, uh, the width of that uh, section. Uh, beta is area heat transfer, the volume of the side. Hydraulic diameter is given. And now this parameter shows up to be important. It was like our last one, wasn't it, to be important? Um, but this T inlet, that was, we're going to find that this one shows up to be pretty important. Following the textbook, they specify an absolute um, uncertainty in that temperature. So it's uh, 50 degrees F plus or minus 5.5 degrees F. If you take a look at the textbook, they use it in Kelvin or something, but it's the same amount of uncertainty on an absolute scale. All right. I mean, if you put the 5.5 degrees F and you have 50, then you transfer this to degrees R, Rankin, uh, does you'll have 460 plus 50. Won't that be 510 plus or minus 5.5 degrees R? So when you switch from Fahrenheit to Rankin, the percent uncertainty changes, but the absolute certainty shouldn't. So avoid sometimes the fractional or relative uncertainty for something like temperature and just specify it as an absolute uncertainty. All right. So we have the mean temperature. Uh, that's an input to evaluate some properties. Thermal conductivity, all of these. I even changed this. It didn't matter. Uh, this is what they, I think they used in the book. But even with 10% uncertainty, what you find is analysis is it's a who cares. Even though there's some significant discrepancy in what value should be used, as well as a large uncertainty for it, it, it may not drive the answer. All right. Then the, this is how you handle that Colburn uh, uh, uncertainty in it. 
I have a function that I can go and say, here's my Reynolds number, go and do the interpolation between data points and give me back one value of j. And then I multiply that value of j times 1 plus or minus 0.25. So it'll be 0.75 to 1.25. That's the range. So that gives you the 25% uncertainty in that heat transfer factor. Here's the same for the friction factor. Well, you just keep on going. Didn't get the 50, but we got the 44 val values. Um, they put two of them as common, not necessarily associated with side one, but are common. What are they? The plate thickness between the two sides, the plate thickness. And they said, we're going to have some fouling on both sides. So it's not unique fouling on one side and fouling on the other. It's fouling on both sides, so it's counted twice in the, in the resistance to heat transfer equation. And um, take a look at the uncertainty in this fouling factor. 100%. So the nominal value 0.0023 plus or minus 0.0023. So it's huge, it goes from zero up to quite a bit. All right? So now the, the, the thing is, is we want to reproduce in Excel something like that. Okay. Uh, first of all, where's their fouling factor anywhere? Even though it's a huge uncertainty, the model for those other values of the inputs isn't sensitive to the fouling factor. It's more sensitive to other things. Uh, so the importance is, is, um, is not showing up for the fouling factor. Well, here are the results that I calculated before I jump into it. Let's just show it to you. So we're familiar with t comparing Q as an output. First of all, you got to get your mean value, right? Well, the mean value is 177,508 BTUs per hour, which gives you 52,055 watts. Given that I was not interested in rep replicating the work exactly, I have my own code, the same code that I used, none of their code. It's pretty good. What was their, what was their nominal value for Q? Wasn't it 51,000? Actually, I think it's rigged. I don't even believe myself. Student would do this, I'd say, ah, no, 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 right? Did I tell you that one story? It's an old story. Anyway, sometimes people just say, what do you want, boss? And then they, okay, I'll give it to you. And it's like, forget about the rigor of the analysis and the experimental, it's just whatever you want, I'll give it to you, right? So this almost looks too close, but truly, that's just the way it came out, 51,000 versus 52,000. All right, so now let's take a look and compare. This is my calculations. How many inputs did I have? Put them all out. How many was that? Did I say 48, 44? Yeah, 44, 44 inputs. Right over here is the fouling. Oh, it has a little bit of contribution because it is uncertain, but it's in the noise, isn't it? Isn't it in the noise? So what's dominant for the Q? Well, how about T1 and T2 in the inlet temperatures? They're driving the, the heat transfer, and both of them have very high. And then this other one, J on the first side, on side one, J Colburn factor. My guess is the heat transfer is limited by side one. Side one is too restrictive. Side two is pretty easy to move the heat through side two. If I did this, and I'm, we can do it, I'm sure I do, I've done it, is I looked at the percent of the thermal resistance associated with side one, and it's a lot bigger than, well, maybe not that, that much bigger, but it's greater than the percent of the thermal resistance associated with side two, or the fouling, two, two foulings, or the conduction through the plate. Okay, so getting that fluid out of the air on side one and into some thin surface on side one is the hard part. That's why this J comes up and not 
not the J for surface 2, which is right here. Okay. Now, the other one was the specific heat surface 1, mass flow rate of surface 1. So mass flow rate of surface 2, and uh, or side 2, and then the specific heat side 2. And then what was this, like the seventh is the hydraulic dimer. It, it's a good comparison, isn't it? Just do them side by side, it makes it hard to read them. But it's almost, like I said, if a student submitted this, I'd be a little more skeptical. But I did it myself, honest. So let's take a look at another one. Oh, this one I can't read. Let me see. Yeah, that's Q. Well, they had them for how many of their outputs of interest? Delta P. They have it for the temperature on side one out outlet pressure loss side two, and then the temperature side two exit. And so you can just make a comparison. Here's the only other one. So the pressure loss side one, overall pressure drop. And what we find is uh, DH1, the hydraulic diameter on side one. Here's DH1. Let's take a look. It's between 50 and 60%. Let's take a look. Between 50 and 60%, almost too good. All right, let's look at the next one down. FF1, so it's that friction factor for side one. And it's roughly around a little over 30%. That's friction factor side one, right at 30%. And then almost dropping off. So these two are taken into account. And then you jump down to the mass flow rate of one and beta one. So here's beta side one and mass flow rate side one. Well, does that all make sense? Can I do this? Can I switch to Excel? And then we can play and change some numbers if you like. Is there another, is there a program specifically made for doing uncertainty calculations or no, there's, I'm sure that there's uh, commercial codes out there, and uh, I just don't have one that's available uh, to students. Um, there's a probability and reliability class. Did anybody take a technical elective like that? What did they show you? Yeah, but which software was did you use? Oh, Minitab. Which one? Minitab. Minitab? Yeah, it was Minitab and Excel. Minitab and Excel, okay. So I've never used Minitab. It sounds like a ver ver variation of SAS or something like that. There is so many of these softwares out there that, uh, uh, so uh, they used to be more, oh, you, a lot of people would make them and publish them and, but it's just too many and nobody else would use it. So let's do this. Uh, let's go to Excel. So um, this is a big code. Let me try and give you, oh, there was one other thing I was gonna do for it. I was gonna give you a roadmap of the Excel code, just like before. This is my preference. So you have a big, huge sheet. And so up here, you put all of your inputs and you put the input with the nominal value, so the name and then the value. Before you add any uncertainty analysis, <laughs> you get everything to run in one long, tall, we call that column. And down here, I like to put all the guts of the run, and then I like to bring up some of the key outputs. And I usually leave them down here but when I decide to bring up an output, I just say copy that cell up. I'm not moving so much. Just maybe, so what if it's not so it's efficient in space, but it's efficient in my mind, right? So then I'll have output, 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 whatever, which ones, and I may want to explore changing an output and explore its impact right now with you. Uh, then once I get the whole system running, where I give it new values of all the inputs, how many did we have? 54. How many inputs? At least five or six did we have, right? 
And there's, I don't know how many, probably 100 plus lines or co in entries. A lot of times Excel is spread out this way. You just have to turn, take all of that and make it long in a column. Then we have our uncertainties and we make a perturbation matrix. So each one of these are sets of runs ready to go. We copy over every one of these over so that now it's being a run completed with a different set of inputs, different set of inputs, right? And then you can do some processing on the output information to get the uncertainty. So you get the mean of the outputs of interest as well as the uncertainty in the outputs of interest. Does that roadmap help? Did anybody play with an Excel code that I showed last week? Some implement it. Just implement it. Implement it for the easy case, small case, then build it up for a larger case. This is a gargantuan case for Excel, although you could do larger. So now let's jump to Excel because I can't see it all at one time. So here are the inputs, the names, the numbering, and then the values. And then right below this, I need to then come in with the outputs. And for each of the outputs, I really need two lines because there's some calculation to get the uncertainty. But uh, what I do here is, is you can sell. I just go and get D88 and bring that up. So down below is really all the guts of all the calculations. So there's all the guts of the calculation. It takes me a while to get it to work. I never work it out linear. I get it to work spreadsheet, and then I transform it to a column. OK? And believe me, it's all linked together. It's, it's just, if you want to take a look, we can peer into any part of it. Like, this is G. So there's the area of the free flow for side 2. Um, this is the frontal area. L1 times L3 and et cetera. Sometimes I use the names. Here's that Colburn. So I'm calling an algorithm built in that I made to get that factor as a function of D160, which I'm sure is the Reynolds number. And then I multiply it by D43, which is the uncertainty. Come up to D43. It's the uncertainty right there is the uncertainty in the Colburn factor for side two. So that's how we handle it, making the uncertainty in the Colburn equation. All right, um, does that ask me a question? Do you have a question? Does that make understandable, get everything to run in a column? And usually I just bring things up from below for the outputs and then I have Inputs, outputs. And then I have the, now I, the, the calculation goes like this. I go like this. So basically, get the perturbation matrix, bring over this, then calculate the uncertainties. All right. So you have up under the outputs there the intermediate calculations and I guess common? Yeah, uh, basically any intermediate calculation I want to investigate. Like I said, oh, let's take a look at the effectiveness of the heat exchanger. Well, the nominal value is 0.685. And then I can calculate, oh, it's my calculation show me there's a 4% uncertainty in it. And what drives it? What drives that uncertainty? And I take a look, and I come across, and I'm looking and looking, and right there's 75%. 75% is J1. So the, the effect in this, in the heat exchangers, controlled by the uncertainty in J1. That's what's really important. <laughs> so everything shows me it's J1. Um, I don't know if that helped. Did it help? OK. Please don't hesitate to ask questions. So also, well, I, I put in the value in converted this to the watts, and then I could do a quick comparison with the textbook's value. And so that's pretty good. Look at the delta P. This is almost, no, that's unbelievable. I mean, really, 1,976. I must have fudged something. 
340 to 340? Three significant digits of agreement? Impossible. But it is. I just followed the text and implemented it. Here's 650 to 660. That's more reasonable. 310 to 310. That doesn't look reasonable at all. I mean, it looks too close. Okay. So now when we already looked at visually this information right here for that Q, okay? What you can do is once you get this set up, what I do is I typically scroll over and somewhere I'll put a plot like this in this same sheet. And this plot is for the, the pressure loss, overall pressure drop in side two in units of pound force per foot squared. And it takes a little bit of work, but it's readable and every one of those are plotted. And if I click this, you can see where it's grabbing the data. You can just come right back here, see what's highlighted. So I get the names of everything in that purple. And then the values of the importance, normalized importance in the uh, blue. And then uh, right there is the name that I put at the top of the table. So I can edit that um, uh, it, and, and, and reproduce for another output of interest. It's not that hard to do. And then you can take, take and uh, interrogate it, okay? Well, let's do this. Here is for the Q, we already looked at that. There's the pressure loss on side one. There's the exit pressure. Now this one takes a little more time to interrogate, right? So the exit temperature for side one, which is the cold side, is 153 degrees F for 340 Kelvin. And uh, it's controlled primarily by J1. Again, J1. On side one, that's restricting the heat transfer. And then T2 in and T1 in, well, that's down here. That's, it's like most important, second most important, third, fourth, and fifth are kind of tied. CP2, CP1, and M.1. And then, uh, oh, this one's tied to the mass flow rate of two. And then this is for the hot. Now this would be a particular interest for design engineer. You can see the type, hopefully you can see the type of questions you might be able to answer. And then this is the effectiveness of the heat exchanger controlled by J1. All right. Well, uh, should I modify this? We could take and do another one if you like. Uh, a lot of these, if you take a look at a lot of these plots, like that R, you would really think is important, isn't it? With such a huge uncertainty, that's that fouling factor. And you come over to the equation, there's the fouling factor. Yes, it's a huge uncertainty. Boom, away it goes. But I think below, I calculated, I mean, this is an easy way of doing it. Um, oh, this is one thing I looked at. What's the fraction of the thermal resistance only due to side one? 70%. That's what's restricting the heat transfer. So that's why J1 shows up a lot of the time. But if I, it's deep in the bowels, but that's like a lot of codes, right? This is the fraction of the thermal resistance escape due to the conduction through the plates. 0.06%, throw it out, throw it out. This is, um, well, I didn't clean it up as best as I could. Mm, it's fouling. Fouling on side one contributes 1.3% to the overall resistance to heat transfer at the nominal values. And 70% is side one. If I take a look at side two, resistance uh, side two, fouling 1%, 28% due to getting it out of the fluid into the fins, okay? And there's all your pressure drop calculations with term one, term two, term three, term four, um, and the total pressure drop.
let's go ahead and do that. This is the input for the fouling. It's 100% uncertainty. And so how important is it for each of those? If I do this, um, for this, this guy right here, this is the percent importances. And I have to go over here, um, right there. It's 0% foul. This whole column is devoted to uh, the fouling. So for Q, 0. For the next one, 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 0. For, that, for the last one, 2%. 2% for, I think it was effectiveness of the heat exchanger, yeah. And what, now, this is a question. If I change some values, let's say I change, ah, just pick one. Which one was really important? The temperature input, right? Wasn't T1 in important? It's 5.5. What will happen if I change it to 12 degrees? I mean, it really on a certain time, the input. Well, it changes everything. That's the beauty of Excel. And by increasing the uncertainty in T1, I jump the Q, and now look at it. It dominates because it's so much. So the uh, sensitivity of the response to that input didn't change. But the uncertainty of that input changed. The product made it more important. And so it's much more important now. Now it's a, it explains almost 50% of the uncertainty in the output Q. Likewise, it probably doesn't have an effect on this one. No. Pressure loss, not affected really. And then um, does affect the side one exit temperature. Yeah. Um, does affect exit temperature side two, et cetera. So we can jump back here. So uh, it is these values, you know, they're sense they have an effect on the other ones. So if it's becoming more important, the other ones are becoming less important, pushing them down. Uh, which other one would you like to explore? Like. Um, I mean, we could take a look at these loss coefficients. How do they affect the pressure drop? Put 30% and 30%. This is for side one, right? So we just changed those two. Let me color code them so I can find them again. And let's go to the pressure drop side two. And the loss coefficients KC and KE at side one, they're just a little blip. So there's no sense getting in fight with a coworker or a boss about we need to get a better number on this input parameter into the model. It doesn't drive it, right? I mean, sometimes you really f argue about trivial things in the workplace or wherever, wherever else, right? Anybody married? Yeah, when you get married, well, to find out, you'll argue about a $2 expenditure. <laughs> it's like, excuse me, the household budget's like 2000 a month, and here we are spending 20 minutes arguing about a $2 expenditure. You know? But what adds up, sure. Yeah, you wait, wait till you're married, then you go for that one. But it's the same for the workplace. You, know, you find out that people are bogged down in trivial aspects sometimes. What were these set at? I can't remember. Were they set at 10 and 10 or 15 and 15? 10 and 10, 10 and 10. So you can uh, play a lot of uh, what if questions. Any other thing you would like to explore? Yeah, the mass flow rates up here, they, they are already important. So if I and put this up to 15%, it's going to really take a control. Sure, you can put it to 1% and it'll diminish then the effect on Q. Okay, you saw it changing, so the mass flow rate of 1 went down, but the mass flow rate of 2 stays up. But we're changing the uncertainty not the magnitude. Now if you come in here and say not only reduce the uncertainty, leave it at 5%, but now make it 3 kilograms or pounds per second. 
you just pushed it to a whole different Reynolds number. The pressure drop's going to go way up for that side. The resistance to heat transfer will go down because of the increased convection coefficient stuff. Yeah, but but uh, let's let's go explore. There you go. So by increasing the mean without changing uncertainty, it's now that that's not restricting the heat transfer anymore on that side, is it? Not like it used to. It's now. Uh, the mass flow rate of 2, the specific heat of 2, the temperature in of 2. Um, I wonder why J2 is not coming up. I would think J2 would come up. Well, what you can do is go back here, and one of the key parameters is G. G is that mass flux. So let's find G on side 1 and G on side 2. Here's G. That's on side... 1, okay, so it's almost 4, and then we come down here to G, 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 and you can tell I already was looking at it, 1.17. So we have a quite a, a, a high change in the G. What about the J? Where's the J? Oh, come on now, where's J, J, J? Here it is, J sub H, 0 .003. 0 .003. Let's look at J on the other side, and we go down here, side 2, J, a lot higher. That side has a lot higher J. Okay, so there's so many things you can play, but for this part, conceptually leave the mean values alone, just play with the uncertainties. Then when you become a master of that, go back and play with the mean values as well. But yes, the mean values are important. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop this then.